This is a to-the-point summary of the geography chapter called Mineral and Energy Resources. I would suggest reading the book after listening to this. Trust me, you will feel the difference. Check the description for instructions on how to level up your game. Let us begin. We use many items in our daily lives that are made from metal, like utensils and tools. Have you ever thought about where these metals come from? The Earth's crust is made up of different minerals embedded in rocks. Various metals are extracted from these minerals after refining. Feel free to adjust the speed to suit your needs. Moving on. So naturally the question arises, what exactly is a mineral? Geologists define minerals as homogenous, naturally occurring substances with a definable internal structure. Do you know, according to the definition, even ice is a mineral? Well, they come in many forms, from the hardest, like diamonds, to the softest, like talc. This diversity is because rocks are made up of combinations of minerals. While some rocks, like limestone, consist of a single mineral, most rocks contain several minerals in different proportions. There are over 2,000 identified minerals, but only a few are commonly found in most rocks. The specific mineral formed from a combination of elements depends on the physical and chemical conditions during its formation. These conditions lead to variations in color, hardness, crystal shapes, luster, and density for each mineral. Geologists use these properties to classify minerals, but for general and commercial purposes, minerals can be classified differently. Mare. Now, let us discuss the mode of occurrence of minerals. They are typically found in something called ores. An ore is a collection of minerals mixed with other elements. For the extraction of minerals to be economically viable, the mineral concentration in the ore must be sufficiently high. The ease of mining and the cost of extraction depends on the type of formation or structure in which minerals are found. It's essential to understand the primary types of formations where minerals occur. Let us discuss the types of formations where minerals occur. First, we have igneous and metamorphic rocks. In these rocks, minerals can be found in cracks, crevices, faults, or joints. Smaller occurrences are called veins, while larger ones are called lodes. They form when minerals in liquid, molten, or gaseous forms are pushed upward through cavities toward the Earth's surface. These materials cool and solidify as they rise. Major metallic minerals like tin, copper, zinc, and lead are obtained from veins and lodes. Mo. Next, we have sedimentary rocks. Several minerals are found in beds or layers within sedimentary rocks. They form through deposition, accumulation, and concentration in horizontal strata. Coal and some forms of iron ore are concentrated due to prolonged exposure to heat and pressure. Other sedimentary minerals, such as gypsum, potash salt, and sodium salt, form through evaporation, especially in arid regions. Another method is weathering and decomposition. Some minerals are created by the decomposition of surface rocks, with soluble components being removed, leaving behind a mass of weathered material containing ores. Bauxite is an example of this. Next is alluvial deposits. Certain minerals can be found as alluvial deposits in sands on valley floors and the bases of hills. These deposits are known as placer deposits. They generally contain minerals that are not easily corroded by water. Examples include gold, silver, tin, and platinum. Next is from ocean waters. While ocean waters contain vast quantities of minerals, most of them are too widely distributed to be of economic significance. Common salt, magnesium, and bromine are primarily derived from ocean waters. Ocean beds are also rich in manganese nodules. Classification of minerals into metallic, non-metallic, and energy minerals. They are the building blocks of our planet, and they come in a wide variety of types. To help us better understand and categorize them, minerals are typically classified into three main categories, metallic minerals, non-metallic minerals, and energy minerals. Let's explore each of these categories briefly. One, metallic minerals, the group of minerals that contain metals or elements with metallic properties. These minerals are prized for their physical and chemical characteristics, making them essential for various industrial and manufacturing processes. Some common metallic minerals include iron ore, 
Used in the production of steel, iron ore is one of the most widely used metals globally. Copper. Known for its excellent conductivity, copper is vital for electrical wiring and electronics. Gold and silver. Highly valued for their beauty and rarity, gold and silver have been used as currency and in jewelry for centuries. Aluminium. Lightweight and corrosion resistant, aluminium is used in construction, transportation, and packaging. Lead and zinc. Lead is used in batteries, while zinc is essential for galvanizing and in various alloys. Non-metallic minerals. These minerals are a diverse group of minerals that lack the metallic properties of their counterparts. They are used in various industrial applications and daily life. Some examples of non-metallic minerals include salt, common salt, sodium chloride, is used for seasoning food and in chemical processes. Gypsum, used in the construction industry to make plaster and wallboard. Limestone, a key ingredient in cement and used in construction and agriculture. Quartz, used in making glass, electronics, and gemstones. Kaolin, clay, used in the production of ceramics, paper, and as a filler in paint. Next, we have energy minerals, which are vital for producing energy such as electricity and fuel. They play a significant role in powering our modern world. Key energy minerals include coal, a fossil fuel for electricity generation and industrial processes. We also have oil and natural gas that power vehicles, heat homes, and generate electricity. Uranium, used in nuclear reactors to produce electricity. And thorium is an alternative nuclear fuel source. These three categories of minerals are the foundation of our modern society. They serve various purposes, from constructing buildings and manufacturing goods to powering our homes and industries. Understanding their classifications and applications helps us appreciate their significance in our daily lives and the global economy. As we continue to explore and utilize these minerals, it is crucial to do so sustainably to protect our environment and ensure future generations have access to these valuable resources. Let's now talk about India. It is a country with lots of valuable minerals beneath its land. But these minerals are not found everywhere. They are spread out in different regions. In the central part of India, the peninsular region, we find lots of coal, metals like iron and copper, mica, and various non-metal minerals. On the sides of the peninsula, in places like Gujarat and Assam, there are oil deposits. In Rajasthan, which is in the northwest part of India, there are many minerals that don't contain iron. In the flat areas of northern India, there are very few valuable minerals. The reason for these differences is how these minerals were formed in the earth over time. Now, let's look at where some of the important minerals are located in India. It's important to know how much of the mineral is in the ground, how easy it is to get out, and how close it is to places where people need it, all affect whether it's worth mining. When all these things line up, we can turn a mineral deposit into a mine so we can use the minerals. First, we have ferrous minerals, and its first subcategory is iron and manganese. Ferrous minerals are a big deal in India, making up about three quarters of the total value of metallic mineral production. These minerals are essential for building things and industries. India doesn't just use these minerals at home, it also sends them to other countries after fulfilling its own needs. Let's talk about iron ore, the building block of industry. It is like the superhero of minerals. India has lots of it, and it's pretty good quality. The best kind of iron ore is called magnetite, and it's like a magnet, super useful in electrical stuff. Hematite is another type of iron ore that's really important for industries. It's not as strong as magnetite, but still good. In India, most iron ore comes from places like Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Karnataka, and Jharkhand. These places are like the champions of iron ore production. Odisha and Jharkhand are known for high-grade hematite, but Chhattisgarh boasts super high-grade hematite in the famous Bailadila Hills. There are a few iron ore belts that dominate the industry. One such is the odisha jharkhand Bell. Odisha and Jharkhand have the Meyerbanj, Kendujhar, and Singbum districts, which are treasure chests of hematite iron ore. Next, we have the Durgbastar chandrapur Belt, where you'll find the super high-grade hematite in the Bailadila range, making it perfect for making steel. 
Third is the Balari Chitradurga Chikamagaluru Tumakuru Belt in Karnataka, as home to massive iron ore reserves, with Kudramukh mines being one of the world's largest. Fourth is the Maharashtra Goa Belt. Goa and Ratnagiri district in Maharashtra have their share of iron ore, even though it might not be the best quality. Make sure to note these down for proper revision. We have uploaded a summary for each chapter for history, civics, economics, and geography. Make sure to subscribe to Excel in your exams. Other than these, we have a playlist that covers your entire English curriculum as well. Comment if you need more. Okay, enough of iron, we move to manganese, the steel sidekick. Manganese is like iron sidekick, helping in making steel and other useful stuff. To produce one ton of steel, you need about 10 kilograms of manganese. That's a lot. The exact process can be understood in metallurgy, covered in the Metal Nonmetals chapter of chemistry. Manganese is also used in making bleaching powder, insecticides, and paints. So, iron and manganese are like the dynamic duo of minerals in India, playing crucial roles in building things and industries, both at home and around the world. So, if there are ferrous minerals, then there must be something called non-ferrous minerals. As the name suggests, non-ferrous minerals are minerals that do not contain iron in significant amounts. They are valuable resources for various industries. Common non-ferrous minerals include copper, aluminium, lead, zinc, and gold. These minerals are essential for manufacturing, electronics, and construction due to their corrosion resistance, malleability, and conductivity. Let's begin with the copper and bauxite story. While India doesn't have super impressive reserves and production of non-ferrous minerals, they are still quite important. These minerals include copper, bauxite, lead, zinc, and gold, and they play key roles in various industries like metallurgy, engineering, and electronics. Let's take a closer look at copper and bauxite. Super Duper Copper, the electrical superstar. When it comes to copper, India doesn't have a lot of it. But copper is incredibly versatile and essential, especially in making electrical cables, electronics, and chemicals. The main copper-producing areas in India are the Balahat mines in Madhya Pradesh, the Khetri mines in Rajasthan, and the Singpum district in Jharkhand. Copper is precious for its malleability, meaning you can shape it easily, ductility, or you can stretch it. And because it's a great conductor of electricity, bauxite, the source of aluminium magic. It is the special stuff that gives us alumina and then aluminium, which is very important in various industries. Aluminium is unique because it's strong like iron, but super lightweight. It's also a good conductor and can be easily shaped. Bauxite comes from the breakdown of certain rocks that are rich in aluminium silicates. In India, bauxite deposits are mainly found in the Amar Kantak Plateau, Mykal Hills, and the Bilaspur Khatni Plateau region. Odisha was the largest bauxite producing state in India in 2016 to 17, and the Panchpatmali deposits in the Koraput district are a big part of that. So, even though India doesn't have huge reserves of these non ferrous minerals, they still have a vital role in industries like electricity, electronics, and even making things strong and light like aluminium. Enough of metals, non metallic minerals should get their due coverage. Let's begin with the mica and limestone story. Non-metallic minerals may not be as famous as metals, but they are equally essential for various industries. So, mica is a thin but mighty mineral, quite unique mineral that comes in thin plates or leaves. It can be split into incredibly thin sheets, and these sheets can be stacked, and even a thousand of them can fit into a mica sheet just a few centimeters tall. They can be different colors like clear, black, green, red, yellow, or brown, quite versatile. Thanks to its excellent dielectric strength, low power loss factor, insulating properties, and ability to resist high voltage, mica is super important in electric and electronic industries, especially in making capacitors, or commonly called condensers for fan, which is not the correct term, but it's said so. In India, mica deposits are mostly found in the northern part of the Chota Nagpur Plateau. The Kaderma Gaya Hazaribagh Belt in Jharkhand is where a lot of mica comes from. Rajasthan, especially around Ajmer, is another significant mica-producing region, as is the Nellore Mica Belt in Andhra Pradesh. 
Next, we have a rock mineral called limestone, the building block of modern civilization, which is often found in rocks made up of calcium carbonates or mixtures of calcium and magnesium carbonates. Do you remember carbonates from class 9th chemistry? Most certainly not. Anyway, it's commonly found in sedimentary rocks from various geological formations. Limestone is essential for the cement industry, as it's the raw material used to make cement. It's also crucial for smelting iron ore in blast furnaces. Let us look into the production of limestone in various Indian states for the year 2018-19. The production of limestone was shared among different Indian states, the highest being Andhra Pradesh, contributing around 20% of the total production. Rajasthan followed closely, contributing about 19%. Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, and Chhattisgarh also played significant roles as well, with shares of approximately 15%, 14%, and 12%, respectively. Other states contributed smaller percentages to the overall production. So, mica and limestone might not be as famous as some other minerals, but they have vital roles in industries like electronics, construction, and even making cement for buildings and iron for industry. Mining all these minerals, be they metallic or non-metallic, ferrous or non-ferrous, is quite risky for both humans and the environment. We shall now talk about the hazards of mining and the conservation of minerals, a delicate balancing act. Ever wondered about the hard work miners put in to make our lives better? Mining brings us many essential materials, but it's not without its challenges and impacts. First, we have the mining hazards, beginning with the health risks for miners. They, often face health risks due to the dust and harmful fumes they inhale. This puts them at risk of pulmonary diseases. Beyond that, they have safety dangers as mines can be dangerous places. The risk of mine roofs collapsing, flooding, and fires in coal mines is an ongoing threat to miners' safety. Next, we have environmental impact. Mining can harm the environment. The water in the region can get contaminated because of mining activities. Dumping waste and slurry can degrade the land and soil, increasing pollution in streams and rivers. Stricter safety regulations and enforcing environmental laws are vital to prevent mining from becoming a dangerous industry for both miners and the environment. The idea of conservation of minerals has gained some traction in recent years. Industry and agriculture rely heavily on mineral deposits, but these resources are finite and non-renewable. They took millions of years to form and the rate at which we consume them is much faster than nature can replace them. This makes our mineral resources extremely valuable, but short-lived possessions. As we continue extracting minerals, the costs rise because we have to mine from greater depths and the quality decreases. To ensure sustainable use of mineral resources, we must make a concerted effort by both Western and Eastern civilizations. This includes developing better technologies for using low-grade ores at lower costs, recycling metals, using scrap metals, and finding substitutes for minerals. Conservation of minerals is essential to ensure that future generations have access to the resources they need to build and grow. Balancing the benefits of mining with its hazards and conserving minerals for the future is a challenge, but it's one that must be met to ensure a sustainable and prosperous world. In all this commotion, we forgot about the third type of resource, the one we use every day, every second. These days, it is practically synonymous with air. So, let us learn about the energy resources. Energy is like the magic potion that makes everything happen in our lives. From cooking our meals, to lighting up our homes, driving our cars, and running the giant machines and factories, we need energy. In India, energy comes from various sources, and they can be classified as conventional and non-conventional. Conventional energy sources, as the name suggests, are the traditional ways to get energy. Firewood and cattle dung cake are one such example. In rural India, the most common sources of energy are firewood and cattle dung cake. They provide fuel for cooking and heating. However, they are becoming harder to use as forests are shrinking, and using dung cake means less manure for agriculture. Next is coal. India is blessed with a lot of coal, and it's a vital source of energy. We use coal for making electricity, powering industries, and for our daily needs. It comes in various forms, from peat, which is low quality, to lignite, bituminous, and anthracite, a high quality coal. Important coal reserves are in places like Churia, Raniganj, 
and Bokaro in the Damodar Valley. Akshay Kumar's movie Mission Ranaganj can be useful to visualize what the life of a miner is. Third, we have petroleum or mineral oil, which is another major energy source. It provides fuel for heat, lighting, and raw materials for various industries. India's main petroleum production areas are Mumbai High, Gujarat, and Assam. Mind it, it's Mumbai High, not Mumbai. Mumbai High is an offshore oil and gas field in the Arabian Sea, a vital energy source for India's economy. Fourth is natural gas, which is often found in petroleum deposits. It's used for domestic and industrial heating, as a fuel in the power sector, and as a raw material in the chemical, petrochemical, and fertilizer industries. Important reserves are found in the Mumbai High, the Kambay Basin, and the Krishna Godavari Basin. All boils down to electricity, the superhero of energy. It can be generated in two primary or conventional ways. First, hydroelectricity is generated from fast-flowing water, a renewable resource. India has many multi-purpose projects that produce hydroelectric power, like Bakra Nangal and the Damodar Valley Corporation. The second conventional way to generate electricity is a thermal power plant. This is generated by burning non-renewable fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, and natural gas. It's a major source of electricity in India and powers our homes and industries. Energy is the lifeblood of modern society, and these conventional sources keep our world running. But we also have non-conventional sources of energy like solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, biogas, and atomic energy, which are becoming increasingly important for a sustainable future. Most of these are renewable. Non-conventional sources of energy can be called the renewable revolution. In our quest for energy, we've often relied on fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas. But as these resources become pricier and scarcer, we're facing uncertainties about our energy supply. Moreover, the heavy use of fossil fuels is causing environmental problems. This is where non-conventional sources of energy come in, offering cleaner and renewable options to power our world. The good news is, India is fortunate to have an abundance of sunlight, water, wind, and biomass. These renewable resources hold the key to a sustainable energy future. Let's explore some of these non-conventional sources of energy. First, nuclear or atomic energy is harnessed by altering the structure of the nucleus and destroying mass, releasing a tremendous amount of heat that's used to generate electricity. India has uranium and thorium deposits in Jharkhand and the Aravalli ranges of Rajasthan. Kerala's monazite sands are rich in thorium. India has six nuclear power stations, making significant contributions to the country's power needs. Between uranium and thorium, the latter is the much better option for it's a lot cleaner than uranium. Good for us, India has the largest deposits of thorium in the world and the most advanced research facility on thorium. Next is solar energy. India's tropical climate offers vast potential for solar energy. Photovoltaic technology directly converts sunlight into electricity. Solar power is gaining popularity in rural and remote areas. Large solar power plants are being established, reducing dependence on firewood and dung cakes in rural households. This shift contributes to environmental conservation and ensures a steady supply of manure for agriculture. The current PM, Mr. Modi has taken major steps in this field with the name One World, One Sun, One Grid, or OSOWAG. The fundamental concept behind it is to develop a transnational grid that will be laid all over the globe to transport the solar power generated across the globe to different load centers. Third, we have wind power. India boasts significant wind power potential. The largest wind farm cluster spans from Nagarkoil to Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Gujarat, Kerala, Maharashtra, and Lakshadweep also have substantial wind farms. Nagarkoil and Jai Salmer are notable for their effective use of wind energy. Fourth is biogas. Shrubs, farm waste, animal, and human waste are used to produce biogas for domestic use in rural areas. The decomposition of organic matter produces gas with higher thermal efficiency compared to other traditional fuels. Biogas plants are set up at various levels, including municipal, cooperative, and individual. Cattle dung-based plants, known as gobar gas plants, offer both energy and improved manure quality. 
making them an efficient use of resources. Fifth, tidal energy. Oceanic tides can generate electricity using floodgate dams built across inlets. During high tide, water flows in, gets trapped when the gate closes, and then flows back to the sea via a power-generating turbine as the tide recedes. In India, the Gulf of Kambat, the Gulf of Kutch in Gujarat, and the Gangetic Delta in the Sundarbans of West Bengal offer ideal conditions for utilizing tidal energy. Sixth is geothermal energy. It taps into the Earth's heat by using hot water or steam from the ground to drive turbines and generate electricity. India has numerous hot springs that can be harnessed for electricity generation. Experimental projects in places like the Parvati Valley near Manakarn in Himachal Pradesh and the Puga in Ladakh are paving the way for the use of geothermal energy. These non-conventional energy sources are the bridge to a cleaner and more sustainable energy future, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels and their environmental impacts. Conservation of energy resources is our responsibility for a sustainable future. Energy is the lifeblood of our economy, fueling every sector from agriculture to industry, transport, commerce, and our homes. Since India's independence, our economic development plans have demanded increasing energy inputs. As a result, our energy consumption has been on a steady rise across the country. Given this scenario, it's high time to chart a sustainable path for energy development. The two pillars of sustainable energy are the promotion of energy conservation and an increased reliance on renewable energy sources. A call for energy conservation. According to the ACEEE report of 2022, India currently ranks 16th in the energy efficiency of the 25 most power-consuming countries in the world. To ensure a sustainable future, we must take a careful approach to the responsible use of our limited energy resources. There are several ways in which each one of us can contribute. Opting for public transport. Instead of individual vehicles, like public transport systems or carpooling, can help a lot. This reduces the energy footprint of commuting and eases traffic congestion. Practicing smart energy use. Being mindful of turning off lights, appliances, and electronics when not in use reduces consumption and your electricity bill. Utilize power-saving devices to minimize energy wastage, such as LEDs, instead of incandescent bulbs. Embracing non-conventional energy and exploring and investing in non-conventional sources of energy, like solar, wind, and biogas, will help in the long run. By doing so, you not only reduce your carbon footprint, but also contribute to environmental conservation. Remember, energy saved is energy produced. Our collective efforts towards energy conservation and sustainable energy sources can pave the way for a brighter and more eco-friendly future for all. See you in the next chapter. Make sure to listen to this multiple times to ensure success in any forthcoming exam. Subscribe to add value to your life.